Uh, I want to go over the equipment I'm going to use today just to kind of give everybody a good perspective of what's going on. In front of me I have a large 12 quart pot. This is a stainless steel pot with a dual core bottom. It's very heavy bottom. The sides are a little thinner than the bottom so it's it's a very stable solid pot. You'll hear that it's you know I can bang it. It's, it's, it's never been dented. We've had this one for years. Then we have a spoon rest here with a wooden spoon and a chopstick and I'll show you what I'm going to do with those in a couple of minutes. And then we have one of my favorite kitchen tools which is a submergible blender. This is a heavy duty restaurant grade one. Uh, it's got a nice stainless steel shaft. Most of the ones you buy in the store are very plasticky and this whole body here is plastic. Uh, it has got a tiny little, um, what do they call that, serpentine blade in the bottom. And you'll notice that that's completely enclosed in the um, walls of this submergible blender. But if I was to put it flat, you'll see that there are holes for the fluids and the foods to get through the walls, but they're pretty much enclosing. So you can put this down on the bottom of the pot, it lays flat. And then you just turn it on. And this one's got two speeds. And you can puree almost anything. I use this when I make soup. I use this when I make sauces. It's a really great kitchen tool. So we are going to make the tomato sauce now for the lasagna. So what we're gonna do is just turn on the burner and I'm gonna turn it on high for about 30 seconds here and I'm holding my hand over the top of the center of the pot. And what I'm looking for is if I move my hand and wave it back and forth, it's warmer at the edges and it's a little cooler at the center. I'm looking for the temperature to be even across as I move my hand and that's getting better now. So I'm just giving it time for the pot to come evenly up to temperature. And now the temperature is even as I move my hand across. There's no cool spot in the middle. And I'm actually gonna turn it down a bit because we don't really need the pot on high. But I do that to get the pot up to temperature quickly. And I'm gonna put in a splash of olive oil. And what this olive oil is for is flavoring, of course, and also make sure that your sauce doesn't burn so easily and so readily. So I am going to start with chunked tomato and now this is just a simple tomato it's not a sauce it's not a pre-made sauce this is literally just whole or not even whole it's just chunks of tomatoes and see that nice sizzle as it goes in i put the juice and the tomatoes in there sometimes you drain them but this time you don't drain the tomatoes and i've got two cans of these and since the pot's already got the tomatoes in the second can didn't make so much noise and then I am going to add roasted red peppers. Now, the tomatoes I used were Costco, you know, just a generic tomato pieces in a can. No, any, nothing added. No onion, no garlic. When we're making this lasagna today, we have somebody who can't eat onion or garlic. So, you know, I don't, I want to make sure none of that stuff is in the pot. And now we have these red peppers in this jar. This is Mazetta red peppers. You can buy any, can, uh, any brand of roasted red peppers. We happen to like the Mazetta. I'm just gonna step away for a second and drain these into the sink. And I just put my hand over the top and I tip the jar upside down and the liquid's kind of coming out. All right, and I got all the liquid out. And now I'm gonna just pour all these red peppers in, the whole jar. Because this gives a really nice flavor to your pasta sauce. And this is where our chopstick comes in. So the peppers are not coming out so easily, so I'm just gonna stick my chopstick in. That makes an air gap, and the peppers will now start coming out of the, pot, the jar much, much more quickly. There we go. Also, as a blind person, I can sweep the inside of the jar and make sure I've got everything. All right. So we now have all the chunky stuff in the pot that's going to go in. I'm going to take my submergible blender 
And I just put it down in the pot and I just turn on my vertical blender and I start picking up and down. And I am pureeing, I'm going to puree all those tomatoes and peppers because I don't like chunky tomato sauce. So what I'm finding is that there's not enough liquid in there, which um, is pretty normal. So I'm going to take one of my cans that I use for tomatoes. And my mother's tomato sauce recipe said, equal cans of water to tomatoes. So I'm filling the can with water. And when you're just using a sauce instead of a chunked tomato, that actually rinses your can really nicely. So since I had two cans of tomato sauce, I'm putting in two cans of water. And the important thing to know about the submergible blender is it really needs liquid to actually work effectively for you. So let's give it a try again here. And you'll hear it's a much deeper, hollower sound now, so... And everything's puree, much nicer. And I'm just looking for big chunks by moving the submergible blender around and picking it up and putting it down where I find a big chunk underneath it, I turn it on. And the important thing to know is you don't lift the blender too high because it will splash everywhere if you do that. So you need to keep it below the level of the liquid. Almost lifted it too high there. Okay, and we now have a very pureed tomato sauce. I'm just going to stir around with a spoon here and see how we got it. It's very thick. It's delicious already. And there's no seasoning in there yet at all. And what we're going to do now is add two cans of tomato paste. And again, I know without even trying with this one, we're going to need our little chopstick, which I just dropped, so I'm grabbing a new one. And I stick the chopstick down the edge of the can, tip the can upside down, and swirl the chopstick around the edge of the tomato paste. And that gets a majority of our sauce out. And so now I'm going to go get a can of tomato paste water. And again, this is to rinse the can, but also to equalize water to tomato paste. Just swirl the chopstick around the edges, scraping the sides down so that when I tip this water into the pot, we get a majority of the tomato paste out of these cans. And we'll do our next one here. So this time I'm going to do it right into the camera so everybody can see. So I just take my chopstick, go along the edge of this can, and scrape. And then tip upside down, and the paste comes out almost all of it. So see, we've got some paste left in there, and going back to get some more water. can't tip it up for the camera this time but again I'm just scraping those edges with the chopstick making sure I get all the paste off the can and in it goes and there we go so we now no longer need the chopstick that's done for the day and I'm just going to stir this paste and sauce together And we will come back 
in about 25 minutes or so and add some seasonings but right now we just want this to simmer a little bit get some of that water out and merge together all right so i'm back at my pot and i'm just going to stir a little bit here and the sauce is much thicker now it's been about half an hour and the stirring really is not to stir it because this is very well mixed already we pureed it with the blender but it's to check to make sure it's not burning and it is not. The way you will tell if it's burning is that you'll find areas of the bottom of the pot as you rub your spoon over it that are somewhat more sticky or rough. Um, this is not burnt, but it's cooking very quickly, so I've turned the heat down to bare minimum. That uh, My stove is probably much higher than some other stoves. This is a commercial grade stove, but you need to make sure that it doesn't bubble too aggressively and it's just simmering very, very lightly. So now I'm gonna start adding my seasoning. So I'm gonna start with a lot of pepper and I'm just grating pepper in. I believe this is a black pepper. It smells delicious. And I'm just gonna grate, grate, grate. I don't measure pepper, I just do a lot. And that should be enough for this. And I'm going to do some salt. And the way my mother taught me to measure the salt is in the palm of my hand. So I'm just going to put some in the palm of my hand and that's about a teaspoon for those of you who don't like using the palm of your hand and I'm just going to pour it in and I'm going to do the same for all my other spices. I'm going to take a pinch of this, fill up the palm of my hand. I can just pour it into the palm of my hand. There we go, oh, too much, too much, there we go. And the spices we're using today are basil, parsley, and oregano. And one more jar here. And again, I'll just pour a little bit of that into my hand. There we go, about the same size as the salt. And the oregano I have is fresh. I uh, foolishly did not buy fresh basil or parsley because I forgot they needed to go in this dish. I sometimes get confused because I'm used to the recipe my mother gave me with all the ingredients being in Italian and I forgot that, you know, Petrozino is is parsley and basilicoi is basil. So when Mike said, do you need basil and parsley for this? I said, oh no, we don't need that. And of course, as soon as I realized what I was doing, we had left the grocery store and the grocery store was closed. So, um, so I'm just pulling off the leaves of this oregano right now. We don't want the stems. They're tough and kind of icky. So just pulling off the leaves and I'm only going to use about one stick worth of leaves because we don't want too much oregano in this. After all, this is not an oregano sauce. This is a meaty sauce. And of course you can use as much as you want or as little as you want, but moderation for everything is good, I think. You don't want any one flavor to overwhelm the other flavors in the dish. Okay, so there's our oregano in there. And now this is the only modification I make to the recipe from my mother's, is I put in about a quarter teaspoon or a pinch of sugar. And I find that that is, uh, makes it a much nicer um, tomato sauce. It makes it, less likely to cause heartburn. Kind of reduces the acid. And now I'm just gonna stir that all in. There we go, it's all stirred in. And I'm gonna quickly run our submersion blender again, just to get all that stuff and as fine as it can be. Join me at my 
kitchen table and we're going to make meatballs for you. Hi, so we're back and I am now going to make my meatballs to go into the lasagna because Mike loves little mini meatballs in the lasagna. So I have approximately um, approximately three pounds of meat here so I have three eggs you do an egg per pound of meat and the meat I'm doing is a combination of pork and beef so I'm just gonna break these eggs into the bowl and two and And then I'm going to take some breadcrumbs and I'm going to fill my hand three times. One, two, three. And again, it's three handfuls for three pounds of meat. I'm going to now start breaking this in and now you notice that I poured the breadcrumbs over the meat and maybe I got a little extra. That's okay. Usually we end up using more meat anyways. So that's perfectly acceptable. And again, I would normally put garlic in at this point, but we are not going to serve garlic today because we have a person who is allergic to garlic and we always respect people's dietary needs in this house. Because after all, one day it may be our dietary needs that need to be respected. So now I am just literally mixing through. And in a minute here, Mike is going to bring some grated Parmesan cheese. Um, you can use Parmesan, you can use Romano. It should be grated. And the thing to know about the cheese is that it is a binder. So between the eggs and the cheese, it's a binder. Right, so Mike just brought the cheese over. Can I get you to pour that in, please? Because my hands are covered in meat and egg. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, that's enough. And the meat's now already becoming stickier with the um, cheese being added. I'm going to stand for this part a little bit because I need to get some weight down on this meat. And I am just mixing this through. Now, if these weren't for lasagna, I could add red pepper sauce to these and make burgers. Um, there's just all kinds of things. This is very similar to the uh, meat we made for meatloaf. If you want to check out that video, there'll be a link in the description for you. Um, it's just very, very, you know, this is the base way of making a meat, ground meat type dish. All right, and so uh, there's a lot of, so I'm reaching to the bottom of the bowl, scraping the bottom of the bowl, and there's a lot of all wet the same sticky stuff from the, the eggs, sauce, so and oregano, ba basil, and parsley, and that's enough. No, that was just the oregano. That was just the oregano? Okay. That's probably way too much oregano. It's a uh, full leaf, it doesn't bother yeah. all that much. Okay. And the reason he's handling my spices today is because my hands are covered in meat. And I don't want to have to go wash my hands every time I need to pick up a jar. There we go. And the meat is now starting to come together. So initially, you could actually feel the grind of the meat. And you could feel every little chunk of meat. And now it's starting to feel like one big mass. So it's coming together really nicely. And pepper flake. And pepper flake. Thank you and some salt too. Um, so the trick that I did off camera that I figure I should tell you about is I took the meat out about 20 minutes to a half hour ahead of time. 
because meat, of course, needs to stay in the fridge most of the time. And if it stays in the fridge, it's really cold on your hands. This room is really warm right now, so the 20 minutes to 30 minutes made it so that I can put my hands through this and it doesn't feel bad at all. So I'm just kneading this through now. And now what the goal is, is I am looking for the consistency throughout. I don't want to find a patch with herbs and a patch with salt and a, a patch with breadcrumbs. Everything's got to go in. So I pick up in the bottom of the bowl and I punch down in the middle. Thumbs out, not thumbs in. It's important to remember that. So pick up from the bottom of the bowl, then I go flat hand down, pick up from the bottom of the bowl, punch down. Pick up from the bottom of the bowl, flat with my palms down, then pick up from the bottom of the bowl and punch it down. And the reason I do that is because the flat hand just makes sure everything stays in the bowl but the punching actually mixes everything together. And this meat is starting to come together really nicely now. I mean, this now would actually stay together in the pot. This is a good meatball meat, but there's still herbs and parts that there's not herbs in other parts, so I'm still punching down to try and get those herbs evenly mixed throughout this meat. And the meat also was sticking to the bowl, but now it's all coming away as one big giant meatball. Yes, you could cook this as a giant meatball. I wouldn't suggest it. The center wouldn't cook very well. Um, it, uh, it just uh, would take far too long to cook and you'd get a burnt mess on the outside before you had a center fix. I mean, you could do it as a meatloaf and just bake it. But why would you do that when you want meatballs for lasagna? So I'm now noticing that my meat is coming together. There's some really good consistency throughout this. Oh, it's lovely, lovely meat. So these are the same meatballs that my mother uses for lasagna, that she uses for spaghetti and meatballs. Anybody who ever had dinner at our house when we were kids will tell you my brother always hogged the meatballs. But I'm going to demonstrate one of the spaghetti and meatball meatballs first because these are very large meatballs. They are larger than a golf ball. These are the ones that my mother cooks just to eat plain like this. They're about four bites each. So what I did was I took maybe a double golf file size piece of meat. And I just took it between my hands and I start rolling. So to show the camera, we have a nice round globe. There is no crumbing on the outside of it. It looks like it's a solid piece of meat. Now I'm gonna break that down to about four of those. And I'm gonna start making lasagna sized meatballs. These are slightly bigger than a marble. And again, they're just Beautiful, so you take a pinch, but marble size, a little bigger, put it between your palms and roll. And you roll until there is no seams, until it's a solid mass on the outside, and just keep going. All right, so I've rolled up all our meatballs, and our meatballs are now here on this tray, and I am literally just going to put them into our sauce. We give the sauce one more stir, looking for burning at the bottom. No burning, excellent, we're doing well. Sometimes you get burning and it's, it's not gonna ruin your sauce, but you wanna make sure to keep an eye on that so that everything doesn't ruin quickly. So I'm literally just taking our meatballs now and dropping them into the sauce two or three at a time. I don't want to pour them in from the tray because the tray is much wider than the side of the pot and I don't want to lose meatballs on the stove top. And this way I'm also making sure they get randomly scattered throughout the sauce. You could also freeze these meatballs at this stage. We often do and then pull out a package of them. What I do is I put them back in the same styrofoam container the meat came in after washing it. And
and just cover that with a Ziploc bag. Well, put it inside a Ziploc bag, put it in the freezer, and a meal-sized portion of the meatballs. It's usually about six meatballs, and those come out really, really nice. All right, so Mike is gonna do the construction for us today. Uh, what he's doing is starting with tomato sauce. And he's gonna try and get as few meatballs on the bottom layer as possible because you don't really want meatballs on that bottom layer. And he's just gonna make sure sauce is all over the bottom of the pan. And you can tell me when you've done that. So you wanna make sure you have tomato sauce all over the bottom of the pan. And the tip for the blind people is put it in as many spots as you can and then tip the pan in all directions, at angles, and just kind of spread it around a little bit. A sighted person can just use the back of their spoon to spread it around, but for a blind person, you're gonna do both. And don't be afraid to use your fingers. Fingers work just fine in this situation. All right, how are we doing with the sauce there on that bottom layer? All right, so now he's gonna sprinkle some Parmesan cheese there. And again, you can use Parmesan, Romano, a mix of both, whichever one you prefer the taste of. We're using Parmesan today. And really lightly, you never wanna to put too much Parmesan on. Okay, you've done that. And now we're gonna put the noodles on. So I am going to hand Mike a noodle, which we previously rolled. I didn't think you'd wanna see my noodle making process again. And he's going to try and measure it to the pan. And do you need a knife to cut those? That's done. That's done. Okay. And so he's just putting them next to each other very thinly. Cut that one in half. Cut this one in half. Okay. It's kind of hard. I need a knife. Okay. There's one noodle for you. And you're putting the noodles across the pan so they're touching but not overlapping. These are fresh noodles rolled out with our pasta machine. We can link to that video in the, uh, in the show notes if you'd like. Okay, you need any more? That's it. Okay, so now he's going to put some mozzarella cheese down. And you'll see we have a giant bowl of mozzarella here because you could never have enough mozzarella. And he's gonna do a fairly thick layer of that. Tell me when you're done. And now he's gonna put some boiled egg. And this is my mother's secret ingredient, the boiled eggs. Very few recipes actually call for boiled eggs. And we grate them finely so that you don't even know they're there. They're not even fine. They're not even fine? What are they? Coarse. Coarse, they're grated though, they're not sliced. And it's a fairly thin layer of boiled eggs because they have to go throughout the whole dish. We put 10 boiled eggs into this dish. All right, ready? Next, you're gonna put some ricotta in and you're just gonna dab the ricotta in little chunks all over the lasagna. Remember again that you need all the ricotta we have for the whole lasagna. So to review for you, it was sauce, parmesan, noodle, mozzarella, egg, ricotta, and lasagna. You basically repeat that throughout. So as soon as Mike is finished dabbing in the ricotta, and that doesn't need to be spread evenly because you'd need probably several hundred pounds of ricotta if you did that. It melts very nicely throughout the lasagna itself. And you're going to want a normal ricotta, not a low fat, and not one that's uh, no extra moisture or no moisture. Just a regular ricotta. What brand do we use, Mike? This one's uh, Gilbani. Gilbani, okay. All right. Okay. Now the sauce.
And this time he's putting meatballs in. You probably put a couple of meatballs in at the bottom, but you don't want that many down there because they get lost down there. Parmesan. Parmesan first. Parmesan goes on top of the tomato sauce every time. And I'll start doing noodle for you. Do these ones need to be cut in half? Mm -hmm. Thirds. Thirds, okay. Once you've done the Parmesan, noodle again, and we're just going to keep repeating this process. So we'll come back and show you the final product when we're done. All right, so Mike has been building away here, and we are at the very last layer. And the very last layer now is noodles, so we've gone through the same pattern throughout, and we've just put the last layer of noodles on. And now he's going to put tomato sauce directly on those noodles. This is the last of our tomato sauce, so we measured this quite nicely. You can cons preserve a little bit of it, if not a little can of tomato sauce. Okay, so now he's going to put cheese on. So you'll notice that the order changed this time around. And this will be a mix of mozzarella and Parmesan. You never put egg or ricotta on this top layer. And this makes the nice crusty layer on top. Personally, my favorite part of the lasagna is that crusty layer. Mozzarella and Parmesan mixed. And you're going to put an extra thick layer on top here. Well, use everything you have left is what I'm telling you. We went through those three blocks of cheese. Any more tomato sauce, put it on top. Now you'll notice we didn't fill the pan up to the top. You don't want to do that because otherwise you'll make a mess of your oven. As the cheese melts, it will boil over. Now 
that's our final product. We are going to now put tin foil over top of this. It doesn't have to be completely over top. And the tin foil so that it doesn't dry out too much at first while the cheese is baking and melting. You don't want to make it fairly tight uh, tin foil. You want a fairly loose sealed tin foil. All right, and we will show you the final result. All right, so here we have the final product. We've cut out a couple of pieces already so that you can actually see what the layers look like. Mike, go ahead and point that out to everyone. And you'll see that it melded really nicely together. And this is going to make a really good dinner. I hope you enjoy this dish if you make it. Please let us know if you do. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video. Thank you.